Happy Sunday, everybody. Coming at you from Nashville on the road. And in past musings, you know that I've talked about my observations on our youth, that I think that they are adrift culturally, that the loss of the Boy Scouts program, though I had my criticisms of it, and the replacement with what we have now in particular, have been insufficient to help our kids uh, become adults, help keep them in the fold, help keep them uh, avoiding the cultural contamination of society around them. How can we, how can we advance our own culture uh, to keep these kids aligned to the gospel, to keep them in the fold? Well, what if one way is to make our cultural halls cultural again? The topic of today's musing is the evolution of these rooms, these buildings, these. Um, multi-purpose rooms, uh, how we got them, and how they're being used today, and a few ideas at the end about how we could use them better uh, to help you know, strengthen culture, and uh, not just for the youth, but for, for members at large. This is one where I would love to get your input uh, in the comment section at the end about ideas that you have, because I don't think our so-called cultural halls are very cultural. So let's talk about the past, and then dig into the present. Well, the OG cultural hall is this one right here uh, from Nauvoo, literally called the cultural hall. It was a three-story uh, Masonic hall, cultural hall built in the early 1840s. This became the, the community center for Nauvoo. It was actually dedicated by Hiram Smith, April 5th, 1844, uh, just weeks before he and Joseph were murdered. Uh, it was the tallest building in Nauvoo for quite some time. It could be seen for miles around. It had uh, three stories, and it was the main meeting place for the Masons, uh, but it was also used for dances and theatrical productions of church meetings. It had actually uh, over two dozen uses while uh, the Saints were still in Nauvoo. So this was truly a, a multi-purpose community center. After the Saints left, it was sold at auction for $4.50, which sounds crazy. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints finally took possession of it in 1967. They bought it then, renovated it uh, to restore it to what it would have appeared like at the time that the Saints were there. And now you can go uh, and, and see a, a play put on by the Nauvoo missionaries called Rendezvous in Old Nauvoo. It's a musical, comedy, and drama about life in Nauvoo. Um, and so that, that's kind of the original concept, the original use of the cultural center. Now, as the saints, the largest body of the saints, rather, moved west, following Brigham Young, uh, they continued building meeting houses uh, in what later became known as Utah. Uh, and early pioneer meeting houses, they had sometimes you know, separate buildings for different uses. The Relief Society is meeting elsewhere. They're meeting in people's homes, even using schools for uh, auxiliary meetings, for social functions. So they're kind of spread out as they're trying to, like, build their own uh, edifices. And when they get started, uh, they would create basements. So underneath the chapel area, you would have, like, a 15-foot by 30-foot uh, space that was used for some of these uh, you know, for small meetings, for activities, for classes, um, and they would kind of have this little multi-purpose room, but it was too small for a lot of wards and stakes. They had to get this out of the basement because of the, the space constraint uh, that was there. So as they're building more buildings throughout Utah, what you see is a transition from the basement area to this kind of attached room next to the chapel that could also double as overflow uh, for meetings in the chapel along with its own standalone uses. That's the concept that we're familiar with uh, today. And today, President Nelson is known for being like the builder of temples, right? Really accelerating the, the construction of temples. A century ago, it was Joseph F. Smith who was similarly known, but for the accelerated development of meeting houses. There was this big construction boom. In fact, I'm going to read an excerpt from a BYU Studies uh, a journal article about this construction boom. 
While an increasing number of American churches had social halls, few embraced the concept of amusement halls with the same figure as the LDS church. These halls applied the concept of a gathered Zion to the ward. Every ward had an amusement hall to provide wholesome recreation, while classrooms and the chapel provided religious education. Some of the bishoprics' most earnest pleadings in their building applications concerned amusement halls. Ward leaders took very seriously their responsibility to provide their youth proper recreation in an increasingly threatening environment. Clearfield ward leaders keenly felt the responsibility of our calling as watchmen on the tower and do not wish to spare time or means to guard, advise, and protect our people against that which would lead to the downfall of our sons and daughters. They said they were at a critical point as to whether the priesthood shall control our amusements or whether we will submit to an outside element. The outside threat in this case was someone not from the ward who wanted to build a local amusement hall. The threat to the Burton ward was not theoretical. For the past six years, our young people had been frequenting a hall of questionable character a few miles south of our ward, and we came to the conclusion that in order to hold our young people in the proper environment, it was necessary that we should build a hall that would be under our own supervision. Similar sentiments were expressed by many wards, including St. John's, Arizona. We're surrounded on every side by mining camps, smelter towns, etc., and our sons and daughters have formed the habit of patronizing these places for their amusement. The Elwood Ward Bishopric described in detail their concern. Most people in the area were not members, and last fall they erected a dancing hall uh, there and close by opened up a saloon. They've tried their utmost to get our young people to go there, but so far have not succeeded very well. Clearly, amusement halls were viewed as more than a nice place for ward socials. So as you can see here from this quote, prior to being known as cultural halls, they were originally called amusement halls. Later, they were also called recreation halls, and now today we call them cultural halls. But there was this clear intent for the early saints uh, as other non-members were starting to you know, congregate in these communities and build up their own amusement halls. There was uh, a clear effort to uh, try and create a church-organized uh, and overseen amusement hall that could be, you know, better keep away, you know, whatever, liquor and, and profanity and vulgarity or whatever. So there was, there was this concerted effort from bishoprics, from local leaders who were really trying to find a way. How do we hold our youth? How do we keep them at, uh, keep the, you know, society's culture, keep Caesar and Babylon and all that at bay? How do we create an environment in which our youth can thrive and prosper and, and grow? So even at this time, as the amusement halls and recreation halls are being built on the same level of, of the chapel, uh, you have these, these halls adjacent to the chapel, but they're still not really being used as, as gyms. In fact, the church did construct uh, several multi-state gymnasiums throughout the 1950s. And uh, although their main focus was basketball, not truly like a gym, and these were very basketball-oriented uh, buildings, standalone buildings that were multi-stake and meant to draw on especially a lot of youth. And more modern uh, built chapels all follow kind of a cookie-cutter treatment. They look extremely similar. Uh, however, you know, back in the day, you had more diversity of construction. Here, for example... Uh, are a variety of photos of what we now call cultural halls uh, that have this, you know, stage, uh, auditorium, ballroom size, you know, dancing floor, uh, gymnasium, which really is just a couple basketball standards that are erected for people to shoot hoops. And now, you know, the, the styles are a bit more bland. They're a bit more consistent and uniform and straightforward. Uh, and that's the, the cultural hall that we know today. Uh, you know, in the, in the mid 1900s, as they're doing this construction boom and, and building all these different amusement halls, you know, wards were holding bazaars and road shows and, uh, parties and talent shows and dinners and, and more. It was used a lot more than just a pickup basketball game or overflow seating for the chapel. So why have things changed? What What is the difference that we've got into that has caused this, this change in use of these halls, these, uh, these rooms? 
Well, some people call this the the great introversion, playing off of the the Great Recession or the Great Depression, a decline of community, and what we're seeing not just in our church but in society around us that might be spilling over into how we ourselves are creating community with others of our faith and using community centers, potential community centers like these uh, cultural halls. The share of adults who live alone nearly doubled over the last 50 years. This shows a bunch of different countries, of course, tracking the data. But what you see consistently is a rise in the percentage of one-person households uh, over the past half a century. In the United States, uh, it's you know starting at about 13% back in 1960. And as of 2018, when this particular data was cut off, it was about 26, 27%. So double the rise of uh, single person households. You might say, well, so what? Being alone is different than being lonely, right? It's, it's a different issue as we're talking about, uh, you know, the decline of social connection. Just because people have the means, financial means, and the desire to live alone doesn't mean they're, they're not socially connected with people. Well, here's worldwide data now. Nearly one in four adults across the world have reported feeling very or fairly lonely. And this is a, a massive survey that was done for 142 different countries. It's also a big problem, especially for youth today. In the U.S., 30% of millennials report feeling lonely all or most of the time. 30% of millennials all or most of the time. Uh, the percent of teens who say they go out with friends two or more times a week. Look at this chart. This is uh, totally declined. Boys and girls both in the 70th, 80th percentile for decades uh, until you get into the creation of the smartphone and social media, and then you have this precipitous decline. Uh, so for boys where they were at 82, 83% uh, playing with friends twice a week, now they're under 60%. Uh, girls following the same trajectory as well. There's actually a professor of psychology at BYU who did this large-scale meta-analysis of a whole bunch of different studies. I think it was over 200 studies, over, I think, almost four, there were almost 4 million participants uh, across all these studies. And so she's doing this meta-analysis to try and look at the data of all the studies and link everything together to see if she could find some conclusive finding from everything. So her research suggests that prolonged periods of loneliness uh, and, and isolation from others can have huge adverse health effects, uh, heart disease, stroke, depression, even premature death. Uh, she says, and I quote, there's robust evidence that social isolation and loneliness significantly increase the risk for premature mortality, and the magnitude of the risk exceeds that of many leading health indicators. So this is more than just, oh, shucks, I'm lonely, I need a friend. This actually becomes, apparently, a very real issue, not just to mental health, but to physical health uh, as well, which seems to give an opening for a church that uh, cares about health. We have a word of wisdom. The, we talk about body and spirit, and our body is a temple and all these things. This isn't just some metaphysical religion that we're a part of. It's very much that our body is integral to our own actions and agency and salvation. And so uh, the the grave nature of the decline of culture and community should, I think, have a theological connection enough for us as saints to be concerned with it and do something about it. 73% of people who use social media, uh, heavy users, consider themselves lonely. Three quarters of people who use social media a significant amount consider themselves lonely. Now, my challenge with this is I wonder, is the toothpaste out of the tube, right? Is, is there no going back? Like, this is just the world that we're in. We have to accept it. There's no changing it. There's no way to get the genie back in the bottle or the toothpaste in the tube. It's out. You just got to deal with it. Uh, you know, our, our community is no longer just the, you know, scores or hundreds of people in your little town nearby. So you're going to recreate and, and amuse yourself together uh, and then create culture together. Our community is the world. I mean, I'm coming at you from Nashville, hung out with a bunch of people in Nashville last night, saw a bunch of people that I see from all over the country. And, and my community, because I travel a lot and, and the people that I associate with in my work, my community is quite different than 
the people in my neighborhood or even the people in my ward, right? Who I'm friendly with and I see and, you know, we nod our heads as we're walking our dogs past one another or I see them at the grocery store or whatever. But my community, personally speaking, is not really the people who have the same geographical home base as I do, though I'm friendly with them and though I interact with them, et cetera, et cetera. You know, my community, because of the, the you know, digital nature of our world and the ability to communicate with anyone, my community, my tribe of, you know, like-minded people, people who have similar passions as I do, people who are in the same profession uh, as me, my, my community is all over the place. And so we congregate as we travel around at different conferences or online and so forth. And so if, if, uh, if the model of community, this antiquated anachronistic model of community requires people in a same geographical area to be the one constantly associating with, with one another to create physical community. Uh, is that the toothpaste that's out of the tube? Can we really get back to that? Was that just born out of necessity because of limited means of travel and communication? So by default, your dating pool, your friend pool, right? Your social pool, was all constrained to people with whom you could, you know, connect and reasonably associate with without too much effort. So maybe that decline of kids hanging out with friends, uh, spurred on clearly by the advent of the personal smartphone and, and social media, maybe that's just some kind of inevitability and there's trade-offs. Like, sure, that's a disadvantage, but there are some advantages where like if you're a super nerd and no one around you, you know, likes the stuff that you do rather than just being picked on and feeling totally alone and isolated, now you have an outlet. You can find online communities. You can go to conferences with these other kids. You can find kids three towns over, uh, form your own little, you know, nerd group or whatever, right? So there's trade-offs. I don't think that this is entirely a bad thing. I found my wife online after all on Facebook over a shared dis uh, dislike of Mitt Romney. Uh, back in 2007. So there's trade-offs. Uh, I don't think, generally speaking, the dating pool is that great today. All these apps and things, it sounds horrifying, you know. So there's trade-offs. There's good uses of this technology. There's bad uses. But it is clear that it has disrupted the nature of what community is. Which takes us back to these cultural halls. All across the world, we've got these chapel buildings where we go to worship and we go to have our little Sunday school classes. But I, I theorize that these structures, especially the so-called cultural hall rooms, are vastly underutilized. And though I don't think we can get back to the way things were, nor perhaps should we, I think there's an opening and a need for providing local, physical community far more than we are right now especially in today's day and age where you have this loneliness epidemic. You have people increasingly connected online and disconnected in a personal human sense, which is really where you're going to drive. Like, you know, online connections are superficial. They're limited. They don't have the same psychological uplifting qualities as they do when you're connecting in person with the human. So I think there's a lot of pluses of the, you know, online that have been created, but we, we, it seems still do need to create social connection in a personal, physical, local way. How could cultural halls play into that? Well, what if, uh, what if to start, we call them gyms sometimes. What if we turned them into actual free to use community gyms? Uh, here, for example, is a church news article from Nampa highlighting one stake uh, doing just that and offering community classes. People bring their own, you know, yoga mats and they come and they exercise together. And the church put out this news article talking about how great that is. Look at these people who are ministering to one another and they're connecting. Uh, but at no point was there like, hey, here's a model for what other words and stakes can do. Or here's some changes that we're making to facilitate making this even more, you know, easy to do. Um, so it's great that this one stake had the initiative to do so. What if we, what if we escalated that? What if we accelerated that? Uh, both by knocking down any types of barriers that inhibit people from utilizing these buildings, having to get, you know, layers of permission and chase down the key and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so maybe there, what if there was an easier way to facilitate individuals being able to utilize the building uh, with, with fewer, you know, bureaucratic hurdles? 
But more importantly, like it's not really a gym. It's like you got to bring in everything that you need and then haul out everything uh, that you used. So you whether that's as simple as a yoga mat or if you're getting into like weights or, you know, racks with pulley like cords and swings and like any of that kind of stuff that you might see in a gym. Uh, completely absent and a huge pain if you have to bring it in. So what if there were dedicated rooms in the building to store gym equipment? Uh, and, and I don't know, I'm, you know, I haven't seen this anywhere. Maybe some buildings, some wards have taken it upon themselves to do just that. But what if you had kettlebells and you had, you know, racks of weights and you had different things that could be quickly hauled in and out for storage and safekeeping, uh, but then you'd actually have more of like a gym space where people at designated hours could come in, work out together, um, uh, totally free. That could draw in people from the community. You know, we could encourage more wards and stakes to be doing this because one of the best ways, especially during COVID, when everyone's like, oh, go take your drugs and stay indoors. It's like, no, go get sunlight and go get exercise. All right? like, And so what if the church would encourage not just don't smoke and don't drink and, you know, whatever for the word of wisdom. What if there was more encouragement and, and, you know, a divine push, if you will, to get out and exercise more and have that be part of the, the religious council. And what if our cultural halls could be centered uh, to that so that it's not an expense for members. They're not having to go out to Vasa and get a membership that maybe they can't afford or whatever, that the church would provide that, that space. We could also use these space for, uh, spaces for uh, service projects. Years ago, I, I organized a, a service project uh, before I went to Africa for a few weeks to help out in an orphanage. And we assembled these you know, hygiene kits and all kinds of things and spread out all across the cultural hall and assembled these kits. Uh, my family uh, sometimes uh, used to go to, uh, there's a local church where they would do every Sunday uh, like this assembly line of making sandwiches and little bags with cereal and putting stickers on them saying you're loved. And this was to go then donate to uh, homeless people and help feed uh, the homeless. You know, so what if we had more organized service projects where people could come together, member and non-member alike, and actually contribute together in this kind of temporary work environment in the cultural hall and then tear everything down and clean it away? My wife for years... Uh, every year as the school season approach would do a, um, a clothing exchange. And so people could come drop off all the clothes that their kids, you know, grew out of. And she and some volunteers would then organize it all by gender and size and everything. Uh, and then invite the community, not just members of the, you know, stake that uh, she organized it for, but all kinds of people and, you know, come on over and uh, and so what if, you know, we did that consistently across every state. Now suddenly you're helping with people's clothing budgets. You're, you know, making things more affordable to them. You're rendering service. You could even, you know, increase that. You could have other activities for the kids while, you know, up on the stage or whatever. You, again, like using these spaces more as community, how do we how do we foster this? How do we have it be more than just, you know, one random person sporadically deciding to do it? What if there was more organization here, more effort to... Uh, to to encourage and support the use of these spaces on a consistent basis for community type activities that draw in other people, uh, you know, not not just the the ward Christmas party where we kind of do this perfunctory like you know outreach to some neighbors, but some some way that is actually like enticing to. I mean, like the the clothing exchange, like you know, it's advertised online and word starts to spread and. Uh, you know, maybe it's not awkward, like, oh, I got to go to this Christmas party that this church is putting on and they're going to preach at me. But like actual, you know, like the gym thing, right? It's like here are uses that are truly community based and are going to draw in uh, people without much you know, barrier in the way. A big one, a really big one that I really hope to see the church lean into. In fact, I've heard uh, that there's a couple pilot programs being run right now to to test this out. So I hope that goes well if my source is accurate uh, and that they just put this on steroids and that is using our buildings uh, as a uh, like a micro school or allowing homeschool co-ops to utilize these spaces uh, our children for years have been part of a homeschool co-op uh, in lehigh where we live and for the past many many years we have had to they the co-op has had to rent space from an evangelical church because they too would just have this space where they just use it like on Sundays and then, you know, one weeknight. 
and otherwise it's underutilized for them. They were more than happy to take rent payments and uh, defray the, the the costs of their lease by having the co-op. What if what if there was a no cost way? What if the LDS Church with all these resources, these buildings, these rooms just sitting there throughout the weekday? What if the church leaned into that and said, we want to facilitate homeschool co-ops and micro schools and others that are using, you know, for truly educational purposes. Look, we've got all these classrooms. We've got this open cultural hall space for the kids to get their wiggles out and do their science projects. And, you know, you just keep the chapel itself off limits or whatever. That's fine. But there's all these just classrooms scattered all over. There's a kitchen, you know, do a, you know, baking class or prepare lunch for the kids, you know, and obviously there'd be uh, expectations of cleanliness, uh, which I think if you tell a homeschool co-op, like, hey, you don't have to pay anything. All you need to do is clean up after yourselves, you know, uh, or, or get an additional liability policy such that if there's any damage, it doesn't have to come out of the church's coffers. It comes out of the, you know, the, the homeschool co-op that gets their own uh, coverage policy. These are all totally reasonable things. They're totally doable and feasible. Uh, and any homeschool co-op or micro school would jump at the chance to cut out all the expense of the rent and the leases that they're paying elsewhere. Uh, we've got all these resources, these buildings, these rooms that could be utilized, and the church could get back into, I mean, they could even more formalize it. The church could help directly, not, not that I want it to, but, you know, they could offer more uh, education classes and, and be more organized in the K-12 through space. But at a minimum, just offering these these spaces with appropriate liability protections so that, you know, all of that so that the church feels that they can do it with these uh, costly assets that uh, uh, tithe payers are paying for. But this is totally doable and it's totally needed. And what better way to create community that, and again, like these homeschool co-ops don't need and often aren't uh, uh, organized around religion. Like, sure, in Lehi, Utah, most of the people in the co-op are going to be Mormon, but not all of them are. And, you know, we're meeting in an evangelical church. The evangelical members of the co-op can come meet in a Mormon church, right? And so what better way to create community, especially for families, especially for families with kids, uh, than to offer these places as a place to educate your kids, to rear your families, to have, you know, little plays put on and, and different things, right? Um, it would just be such a, a, an amazing opportunity. Uh, what if beyond that, these cultural halls could be used for uh, community organizations, uh, nonprofits, utilize them for their activities, whether their own, you know, plays and productions or their own service projects or their own, you know, uh, classes or, or whatever. What if, what if organizations in the community could utilize these, provided that the activities that they do inside are open to the community? Uh, so that anyone, you know, could attend. Obviously, the church would want to set some parameters around what's appropriate to, to do and, and whatnot in the buildings, and that's fine. Uh, again, that's all very, very feasible. But, uh, but these resources are underutilized, and there's certainly these, these cultural halls are not being used very well at all to uh, protect our culture, to perpetuate any kind of culture. They're an afterthought. Uh, there are plenty of other amusements that, that kids are going to. The bishops who were concerned a century ago about building uh, priesthood-governed amusement halls to oversee the amusement of the young, uh, that toothpaste is probably out of the tube. Kids are not thinking, oh, what what uh, theatrical production is, is playing at the cultural hall, you know, this Thursday night? Uh, no, like there's an abundance of amusement, uh, Babylonian cultural you know, rot that is all around us. So maybe we're not going to be able to uh, truly compete, but we have to try. We have to offer something. Uh, we have to to try and reclaim our youth and offer them wholesome uh, opportunities to connect with one another, to, to foster relationships, uh, to serve one another, to grow. And and so especially, I think the micro school, homeschool co-op thing is a, a huge winning opportunity. Um, but there's others. I'd love to know in the comments, what are your ideas? I, I, I think that there's an opportunity here, especially, again, with that loneliness ap epidemic, with things just plummeting in terms of social connection, that at least for members of our church, at least for families with young kids before we, you know, these kids uh, turn into teenagers, how can we strengthen social connection? How can we strengthen social fabric? Can these buildings be a resource to bring people together and what barriers do we need as a church to eliminate or reduce in order to facilitate their use, in order to encourage 
their use? How can we get the multi-level bureaucratic, you know, church to kind of step aside and, and open the floodgates and say, we recognize we have this resource. We recognize the need for social connection. We recognize both its mental and physical health benefits. We want our people to create activities and programs and co-ops uh, and, and, you know, cultural uh, activities and we want them to come together. So here's what we're doing to really facilitate that and make that easy. And, and almost like create the marketplace in which you have all these competitive, creative ideas come forward and wards and stakes and groups can learn from one another. And, you know, this, this new use and utilization could flourish uh, and could be a, a solution. It's not the solution to the, this loneliness epidemic, uh, but it could be a solution. And I think it's an underutilized resource. So what are your ideas? I, I rattled off a few, you know, the gym idea, the service project, the homeschool co-op, uh, letting other community organizations do it. How do you think we can create community, especially for the youth, for families, uh, in a way that would be meaningful, that people would actually want to come to, not feel obligated, like, oh, here's the Relief Society enrichment activity, I guess I'll go, right? But like, how do we, how do we get our communities to create community in a way that's enticing to people uh, away from, you know, their smartphones and, and digital distractions. I'd love to know in the comments what your ideas are. If you could snap your fingers and say, oh, I would love to use the cultural hall for X, and I think it would, you know, work wonders. What is that? Let me know uh, in the comments. I'd love to get your input uh, so that we can make cultural halls cultural again. With that, we'll leave it there, and I'll see you next Sunday.